Bennett, and I'm here to talk about Zap, ZAttack Proxy Advanced Features. I have been told that this room is apparently double booked. So if you're not interested in Zap Advanced Features, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> so, so please. <laughs> yeah, so uh, anyway. So no one's going yet? Excellent. <laughs> okay, no problem. Right, so my name's Simon Bennett. I work for the Mozilla security team, and I'm the project leader for Zap. I've done quite a lot of talks in the last few years about Zap, and I've tended to focus on uh, introductory talks, um, kind of setting the scene, letting people understand what Zap is, because you know people haven't known what it is, and I want to just explain what's going on. But you know, hopefully, some of you have seen those talks, and hopefully, more of you know Zap. Um, show of hands, anyone use Zap here? Lots of hands. That's what I want to see. Right, so I'm really looking to talk about some of the more advanced Zap features. Um, I will have a quick introduction to a quick bit of background for those of you who don't know much about Zap. Um, but some of the more basic stuff, the best thing to do is have a look at, you know, my previous talks are, are recorded and you know, there's a lot of information online. We've got videos and things. But what you need to know is, yeah, it does the basics. Um, but what I get the feeling is even people who know Zap very well or use it a lot don't actually know all the functionality that it's got. So I wanted to talk more about that. So a little bit of background um, for those of you who are new to Zap. It's a tool for finding vulnerabilities in web applications. Uh, completely free, open source like all OWASP um, tools. And so there's no pro version. There never will be a pro version. And I, I always deliberately say that because Zap is very much a community tool and I want people to get involved. It is, when I, when I released it, I said it was a tool for developers, a tool for people who are new to application security. And I think that's still very important. That's a really important target market. But Zap has now moved a long way beyond that as well. I want to make sure it's still an ideal tool for those of you new to application security, but it's a lot more than that. It is um, used a lot by professionals. We use it within the Mozilla security team, but I know a lot of professional pen testers who use it as one of their tools. Uh, but it's also ideal for use in a continuous integration environment, um, so for developers to automatically test, do security tests on their um, applications while they're developing them. That's something I've talked about before. I won't be going into that in any detail this time. And it is really becoming a framework for advanced testing, and that's something that I really want to, to focus on today. Um, it is included in all the major security distributions, and I know that you, know, you should never believe online polls um, but I'm still going to make the most of the fact that Zap was voted the top security tool of 2013 on toolswatch.org. And of course, no security tool, no tool is a silver bullet, it never will be, so you know, this is always going to be part of a, a possible you know, set of solutions. We have principles. Uh, I've said we're all, you know, free open source. Uh, involvement is very actively encouraged. You may find it difficult to get out once you get dragged in. Um, it's cross-platform, easy to use. Um, as easy to use as we can make it, um, it's still a complex tool, but we always try and make it easy to use because I want a tool that's easy to use. Uh, and it is fully internationalized, which is very unusual for security tools. It's fully documented, and I say that with some caveats. Uh, <laughs> us, the develop mostly developers, have written the documentation, so it's not perfect. Uh, but, you know, we do have documentation, so you can look and find more information if you need. But we've got lots of online, we've got user groups, um, developer groups, so there's plenty of, info, you know, places you can get information. We also want to work well with other tools. So there's tools like Threadfix, uh, Minion that make use of Zap. You can invoke other tools from with Zap. We know that in many cases Zap won't be the only tool you use. We want to integrate well with those other tools. Um, and we also try and um, do reuse, so we try not to reinvent the wheel. Uh, and if there's good open source components we can use, then we will make most, the most of those. A few statistics for you. So it was released in September 2010 as a fork of Paros. The last release, um, 231, was just over a month ago, and we have already had more than 20,000 downloads, which, is, which I'm pleased with. It has been translated, or is being translated, into more than 20 languages. So we have over 90 translators working on Zap, but we always want more. So if you do know a particular language, you know, if you, English is not your first language and you would like to help translate um, Zap into another one or more languages, then please get involved. 
Now, it's very difficult for me to know who was using Zap and how they're using it. People download it and don't tell me about it, which is fine. Uh, but I get the impression that the majority of people are actually professional pen testers. I want to get it more into the development market, um, but I still, the professional pen testers are very important um, end users as far as I'm concerned. And I've se I, every so often I see something about Zap being just a fork of Paros. I did some calculations, rough finger in the air calcula calculations, and I reckon that the current code base, only about 20% is Paros code, um, over 80% is now new code. We're not, not trying to get rid of the Paros code, but we're you know, putting new functionality in, replacing things, getting rid of old stuff. There's a site called Olo, uh, which I really like because it gives great statistics on open source projects. Uh, and so it has different categories of the, how the, the number of updates. And Zap is in the top category, so it's very high activity. So it's right up there with the Linux kernel and um, Firefox. It is um, the most active OWASP project. And so we had last year, apparently, the 29 active contributors. So those are people who actually committed code. So it's not including all the translators and people helping the documentation. And apparently, it's 278 years of effort. And I have no idea how they calculated that, because I haven't spent anything like that amount of time on it. But that's, that's what they claim. Uh, and all these are statistics you can check up yourself. So um, main features. It's got features. It's got all the standard stuff um, that you would expect from a security tool like this. And I'm not going to go through them now, because I want to focus on the more fun things. Um, so this is, these are the things I want to talk about now. If you want to learn about some of the other things, then please see some of my other talks. I want to talk about context, um, advanced scanning, um, before I get to scripts and something called Zest, and see how I go. I might have a chance to talk about plug and hack. I might be pushed for time. It all depends on how things go. So the first thing is context. How many of, um, quite most of you are here using Zap, how many of you have actually used contexts? No one. I thought somebody might have. Uh, no, that's, that, 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 that's why I'm doing this sort of talk. So contexts are, strictly speaking, they are just sets of URLs. So you can use, they're intended to define different parts of the application. So or applications themselves you like. So, you know, we've got typical case of you've got www.example.com. That's one site, one application. You then have something like, you know, multiple applications on the same site. So, and they can have very different characteristics. So that's a subtree, a subset of a site could be a context. Or a context could actually cover multiple sites. And you could actually have context for parts of applications as well. And this all sounds a bit airy-fairy. So what I want to do is do some demos. So what I've got is the Budget Store, which is my go-to application for doing demos. And I'll just look at a couple of things, and I'm then going to log in as a user. Now, if I go to Zap, you will see that here's our application. And in this particular case, it is a part of the subtree. So I'm going to right click. And we have this including context option. Basically, right click everywhere in Zap. Um, highlight things, right click on them. We try and only have you know, the main functionality you need visible. And still, some people still can't complain there's too much there. But there's loads more on right clicks. And I want to include in context the default context, context one. Actually, I'm going to rename this to budget just to, to remind me. And so a context can have multiple sets of regex expressions for URLs to include and to exclude. Um, and so that's how you define those. And you can do them manually by typing the regexes in, or you can right click include, exclude. Uh, so you can, if you wanted to exclude part of it, you could right click and then uh, exclude from context. But we don't want to do that. So one of the things contexts do is they define scope. So this particular context I'm saying is in scope. And that affects things like, so we have different modes. I always use standard mode, which is the, the dangerous one. But if you go into safe mode, you can only do things, ac actions on context that are in scope. So that's how you define the, the scope. But there's various other things that you can, things you can associate with context as well. One of them is authentication. So we have different methods of authentication that Zap understands: form-based, HTTP, NTLM, manual, script-based. 
I'll come back to the script-based ones in a bit. Now, you can put these in manually. But as I said, we try and be context-sensitive. So we've got this post here, and that was how we logged in. So right-click on that. There's a new menu option, flag as context, and there's only one option, which is form-based authentication login request for budget. So I will select that. And what you'll now see is it's filled out, it's worked out, yeah, it's form-based. That's the URL. We can change it if we want. We can have, tweak that if we like. Here's the post data. It's actually got all the old post data in, but the username parameter is the username password parameter. Not username, it's password. And, OK, so we now have this new icon. So hopefully there you can see it's a kind of door. So that shows us that that's the login request. There's one more thing I want to do. I want to go to one of these requests, look in the response, because I want to tell Zap one more thing. Here we have a, this bit of text saying guest user. Now, you only get that if you haven't logged in. So highlight it, right click, flag as context. We now have different options. That's the logged out indicator. So that's the, indicate, that's the indication that we are not logged in. I could have typed it in there, but hey, let's use the context sensitive stuff. So, OK, we've now told Zap a bit more about the application. Why is that of any interest? Well, actually, I'll go and do a bit more because we can also talk about the users. And I happen to know that there is a user at appseceu.com with a suitably. Oh, I meant to put that in the username. It's good there as well. No, I didn't want to do that. I'm going to type it in. It's a demo. Dot com and a suitably secure password of password. Hope I got that right. And I'm going to do another one because I've actually got an admin, which is admin at appseceu.com. So this is where you can put in all of the, app the users that you have been given to pen test with. So what can we do now? Well, we've actually got, <laughs> go back to here, we have this forced user mode. So we can actually say which user we want to force SAP to use. And up here, you see there's this forced user mode icon, which previously was disabled. And, and it still is not enabled, but the button's there. If I go back to Budget Store, I'm going to log out. So as you can see, top right-hand corner, it says Guest User. Back to Zap, go into Forced User Mode, click anywhere, and all of a sudden I'm logged in as the user. I can log out, and it doesn't matter, because Zap will detect that I'm logged out and log me back in as this user. And I can go back here, and I can go in, and I can say, actually, what I really want to be is the admin and go here, and I can just click anywhere, and all of a sudden, I'm the admin. So Zap now understands about authentication, understands about users, it understands about sessions, so you can choose which user you want to be. And this is really powerful because this affects Zap, all of Zap, so you can spider as a particular user, you can active scan as a particular user, um, you can fuzz a particular user, and you can, it doesn't matter if your application logs you out, Zap will just log you back in. So this is really powerful, and that's just one part of what we can do with context. What I want to do now is, I will come back to this, don't worry. Um, we've got this new budget store, and I'm going to click on a couple of things here. And we've got a different URL, SP budget. And I clicked on a couple of pages, but you'll notice we actually only have, we've got two, request, two pages there, but they're both the same one which is a little bit annoying. And if you look down here, you'll see that the URLs are actually app.jsp, and then the page is actually a request parameter. So what we have here is a single page application. Even though there's multiple pages in the background, as far as the browser is concerned, it's single page. And this is a complete and utter pain, because Zap uses this structure. This is the structure of the application it understands. So if it tries to attack this here, it will actually only attack those pages. It won't attack the rest of the functionality. This is not good. However, what I'm going to do is I'm going to declare this as a separate context. So I don't want it in budget. I want a new, a new context. 
just leave it as two. And one of the other things we can do is we can define the structure. So once you've defined a context, you can associate different things with that context. Authentication, session handling, and things like, you know, how are the key value pairs separated on the URL? How are the, the key pairs separated on both the so URL and post data? And more importantly, for, in this case, structural parameters. Now, structural parameters are my term for these parameters that are actually part of the structure of the application rather than being um, part of the functionality. So I'm going to put page in there. OK, that. And go back and start browsing through Zap. And all of a sudden, now, because I've defined this, we have this extra node has been put in. It's not a real node, but it's, it shows us that we now understand this. So previously, Zap would just attack that one page, even though it represented the whole functionality. Now we can actually see the different parts of the application and attack them separately. So the context allows us to teach Zap how, it, the, how the application works. And the more Zap understands, the more effective it can attack these sort of cases. What I want to do now is show you, talk about advanced scanning. So just make sure I'm. So yeah, that's the thing on context, allows you to define various things. So I want to talk about advanced scanning now. And most of this is going to be demos, so the slides are just for people who didn't see the talk. Hopefully you already know that if you right click anywhere, then you have loads of options and the attack option, this gives you, you know, all the active scanning, the spidering. Somebody was asking me about when we were going to support Ajax spidering. Um, there, we've been supporting it for years. <laughs> it's there. But one thing we can, we have a new thing, which is the advanced scanning. We can get it in different ways, actually. So from the tools menu, there is a, an option for advanced active scan. And hopefully, as you can see, pretty much every menu item has um, keyboard shortcuts. And these are user defined. So we have a load of defaults, um, but you can change them to the order you want. The moment it's Control Alt A, I'm wondering if it should be Control Alt Z for Zap and make it the Zap three-fingered salute. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in via the context-sensitive one because then we will. It will actually bring up the right. I hate this mouse. Right. So what we have now is this is advanced active scan dialog. Anyone here used it? No. <laughs> right, so you have a starting point, and if you want to change that, we can, we've can. got this nice little thing where you can go through and change it to whatever you want. And it's detected the context, which I'll come back to. Uh, we have an option to recurse, but this is a leaf, so that's not enabled, and just in scope, or it's doesn't, not re relevant for this particular one. We have the in input vectors. Now, in the options, there are loads of options. All of these things you can configure for the options. The trouble is, they apply to everything, so they apply from that point on, whereas the active scan, you can just change them on the fly. So, we can, so you can say exactly what things you want, you know, whether it's just a URL query string, the path, post data, anything like that. So you've got fine grain control, and you can change that whenever you like, and that doesn't affect, affect the main, if you just say scan from here, it'll ignore these and just use the standard settings. More interestingly, we have the custom vectors. And this is fun, because what you can do is you can highlight absolutely anything in the quest and add it. And you can do multiple things. And these then are used as attack places we're attacking within the request. You can't do this when it recurses, because obviously you've got multiple um, inputs in requests. But if you've got, just got one request, you can choose exactly what you want. And you can actually say, well, OK, I don't want to attack anything unusual. I just want to attack one parameter. But I only want to attack that one parameter and not everything else. And then what we have, if I stay on that dialog, you can actually disable the non-custom input vectors. So I think sometimes think some people use Zap as a very blunt instrument. You know, you've got the quick scan button. You've got the attack. It just hits it with everything. Um, very script kiddy. Zap is actually a, can be a very sharp scalpel. We can say, right, I just want to attack this particular part of the request. And when it comes down to it, I know exactly what I want. You know, we've got the policy, which, again, 
it applies to everything if you like, but here you can say, well, actually, I don't want to do all these things. So we can set all these things to off. Because what I really want to do is I just want to attack this one parameter with um, reflected cross-site scripting. So turn that back to medium and then start the scan. And it won't do very many attacks uh, because that particular, those, those things weren't vulnerable. But it shows that you can focus down and say, right, this one particular parameter, I want to attack it in this particular way. And one thing do... So, actually, what I'll do is, hopefully, down here, we can look at the request. Actually, no, look at the response. And we'll see what Zap does. It always um, attacks as the, the last session, essentially. So we're doing this as the admin. But I didn't really want to do that. So what we can do is we can go right to uh, click Advanced Active Scan, add that, just something irrelevant. And what you notice, because we detected what context is in, we can choose users. So I actually want to attack it as this particular user. And we have a look at this one here now. We should see we use the user. So what, we, that, what the active scan dialog does, it allows you to focus down to exactly what you want. You can include lots of the, all the, the standard input vectors, or you can say just a particular thing and say exactly how you want to attack it and which user you want to attack it with. So this is really powerful. And we're going to carry on adding to that, adding more options, and probably things like the spider and stuff, we're going to start adding these sort of advanced dialogues so you can get it to control it ex exactly how you want. So what I want to do now is talk about scripting. SAP has a very powerful scripting support. We, what we realize is that when you're doing a pen test, you know, you may, you want the, you'll find situations where you have to change SAP to handle the application better. The problem is, you know, it's great this open source, but do you really want to have Eclipse there, um, download the latest SAP source, build it and work, change it, change the source code? You probably don't. Um, so what we support is scripts, which we try and plug into as many places as possible. So we've got different types of scripts. I've got standalone ones. What I'll do is I'll try and show you some of these things. So we've got this new scripts tab, and you can see all of these different things. So these are the different types. We have templates as well. So if we have a look at some of the standalone ones. So one of the things we can do, loop through the history table. Uh, looks like a Python script, so I will just make a new script out of that. And once we've got one of those, um, we can run it. And there it'll just go through the history table. Obviously, then, you, so this is just a kind of a template thing, and you can change it to do whatever you want. So standalone ones, standalone, you tell Zap when to run them, and they just run. We also have targeted scripts. So let's have a look at a targeted, some targeted templates. Uh, resend as a get request. So right click that, make it a new sc script. And this, okay, in this particular case you can run them, um, but what it'll do, it'll actually ask you what values. So if it, if it wasn't a Zest script, it wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't be able to run it straight away. But what you can do is you can go to the sites tree, or actually it might be easier if I go to the history tree. Here we've got a post message. So we can right click this and there'll be invoke with a script and resend as get request. And towards the bottom, yep. so I then just submitted that, um, po resubmitted that post to get. So with targeted scripts, you have to tell Zap what request you want them to run against. We have active scripts and passive scripts. So these run in the active and passive spy, um, scanners. So you can use these to detect vulnerabilities um, actively and passively. Uh, proxy scripts run in line. So these actually change things dynamically. And so we've probably got another 
So these ones you can't run at all. They go to scripts. Uh, so here, another one for changing all the posts to gets. And this is different in that... So that one, again, what will happen is that will be, when you enable that, that will actually only happen when requests go through Zap. So you can't, I mean, we, can, we do allow you to run it, but then you've got to put all the um, parameters again. So what, but normally the proxy ones will only, will, will happen when they're enabled on every single request. So you can then put whatever conditionals in to affect, so that it runs when you want it. But we also have things called authentication scripts. So Zap understands um, sort of form-based authentication, those simple things. But there are often cases where you have really complex authentication uh, or even just not particularly trivial. We have one option here for WordPress authentication. So this handles WordPress because apparently it's um, non-trivial. I didn't write this one. Luckily someone else did. So what it means is that if you have an application that is uses some non-standard authentication. With that context, there was a, an option for scripts. So you could actually say, right, this is a WordPress site. This is a script I want to use. And you can write these things. We try and make it as easy as possible. So you can actually um, either find some, download one or implement one to handle whatever condition you want. Um, so this means it doesn't matter how complex the authentication is, Zap will be able to handle it. And finally, we have input vector scripts. Uh, and these, so I think we've only got example, we've just got template ones. Oh no, we've got a um, input vector sharp query separator. Um, so I don't know anything about this, but basically the input vectors are how Zap understands the request and how it attacks them. So if Zap isn't attacking their parameters in the right way, maybe they've been encoded or something like that, you can write an input vector script that allows Zap to understand how to attack those things. So it means Zap can attack whatever, what, however, the, the application in the right way. Now these things are all well and good, but the problem is you still have to know something about the Zap internals. Um, you have to have some idea of how, you know, the syntax of the, of the language and, yeah, sorry. So, the scripts are really powerful because what they do is that you have full access to the Zap internals. We're, it's an open source product, so we're not going to hide anything. But what it does mean is you still have to know how to get these things. Um, we document these things. We document it as much as possible. But still, you have to understand the syntax, and it's non-trivial. So what we've got is we've got this new language called Zest. And this is a, it's more of a macro language. And I showed you one of these things before, which was this is, so go to the resend as a get request. And this is what a Zest script looks like. So it's actually graphical. The request, it's, the, it's actually JSON in format. So it's pretty horrible. You wouldn't want to write that. But what you can do is you can just right click anywhere and it will show you all of the options you've got. So you can put in conditions, you can put loops in. And in this particular case, we're saying if the request is post, then we want to check to see um, if it includes a regex, then we just want, sorry, it includes a question mark, then it's already got parameters that we want to append them. Otherwise, uh, it hasn't got any parameters, so we can just put them in after the question mark. So you can very quickly put scripts together, which do very powerful things. And it, this is completely integrated within Zap, even though it's completely separate from it. Now, Zest is particularly powerful. Uh, I'm going to skip most of these, uh, but it's got various, so there's various use cases for, Ze for Zest. One of them is reporting vulnerabilities to, to companies, and we, we use this in Mozilla. So we actually say, if you find a vulnerability in a Mozilla website, we would like you to submit a Zest script, because we get some awful bug reports, as you can probably imagine, um, and it would be really great if we actually have, you know, detailed point by point, this is how to reproduce it. And that's what Zest gives us, because we can just run it, we can look at the script and go, right, we want to point this at a staging server rather than the live one, but we can see exactly what's gone and what happened. It's great for reporting to vulnerabilities developers, because they can actually run these things, they can reproduce them, and they can include them there in the regression tests. And also, um, 
we're trying to get Zest adopted by the security tools, so something like OWTF are adop um, is adopting it, um, and we're creating a new um, Firefox add-on as well. Um, and that means we'll have, you'll be able to use Zest in different security tools as well, which would be great. And you can have DTIP integration, particularly in, in Zap, because we're using it everywhere as our macroing language. Now, I mentioned uh, authentication before. One of the big problems that I have in Mozilla is something called Persona. It is a complete and utter pain. So it's a single sign-on system that actually relies on the browser. You really have to have a browser. Uh, and so it uses client-side cryptography, so public and private keys. It is really hard to script unless you have a browser. And that was one of the things with Zest. It's great on the server side. It's kind of a wrap around doing your server side uh, request responses and manipulating them. But the plan always was to actually move Zest into the client side. And I've just been working on that. It is not released, but the code's checked in so you can play around with it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new standalone script. Uh, it's going to be a Zest one. And what I'm going to do is, so you right for, for Zest, you just right click, and we've got this new option for adding Zest client. And I'm going to launch. So I'll call it, we have to have some handle, so window one. Use Firefox, of course. And I'm going to go to budget. And if I run that, then after a second or two, the browser will come up, and as long as I've got the URL right, we'll go to budget. And actually, what we want to do is we want to, there's comments there. I want to go to the comments page to right click. That's this client. So I want to click on something. I've uh, got various choices. Go for partial link text. Go for com. And so if we run that, then we'll go to the comment page. So we have all, so we can now control the browser, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, but a couple of things, you know, one, it's a little bit of a pain to go through all these things to contribute to the script. It's not too bad, but a little bit of pain. Um, and then two, you know, why would you use this? How would it be useful? So, so happens last week, I had a persona application, uh, application protected by persona to test. And this particular application, once you'd logged in with persona, allowed you to put your username in. And this username is then used elsewhere in the application. So this would be good for persistent cross-site scripting, wouldn't it? Trouble is, I've logged in via Persona, I've chosen my standard, you know, simple username, and then I can't change it, because the application doesn't allow it. So I've now got to go and register a completely new Persona ID to do this. And Persona, so it's a very, you know, you have to have a browser, and then you have to, you know, it sends you an email, and you've got to OK that, a complete nightmare. If only I had a way to script that. Can you guess what's coming? No. So I'm actually not going to run the script because uh, the Wi-Fi here is awful. But I have got a recording. And so here, the script, which I'll show you in a minute. So we are now going to Persona. And what I'm doing is I'm putting a randomly generated mailinator.com address in there. Persona's going, well, you're not registered, so we sent you an email. All well and good, what can we do? Well, we can now go to mailinator.com for that particular user. And this is a nice Ajaxy thing. We wait until the email comes along. Email comes along, we click on it, and we then say, OK, final thing, last step, log in, and there we are, we have a new Persona account. Now, that actually, so that is the script which I've got. Um, it's one of these ones. So that is the script. And I actually put some sleeps in the one you saw there just so I could talk over it. So it actually get, runs quicker than that.
So just to remind you what I'm doing, I've completely automated the creating of user and the, the clicking email, so authenticating via email that that user was valid. So what I could do, I actually could create a Zest script. I wrap this. So with Zest, we can have loops. So I loop through a file of cross-site scripting attacks, called this, could have my new user logged into that user and then used the, it, each one of those t attacks from that file as the username. So I was able to fuzz the username, which was protected by a single sign-on system that required email authentication. Do you like that? Can you see some possibilities now? So here's a thought. You've got an application that detects that you're, uh, that you're doing bad things and blocks your user. How can you scan an application like that? Well, Zest scripts, this, there's no concept of, you know, Zest, okay, it does server-side operations and client-side operations. But they're all the same script, and these scripts can be used anywhere. So you could create an authentication script that actually creates a brand new user. And then you can tell Zap how the authentication works, except it's not really how the authentication works, it's creating a brand new user. You can start scanning, you can put Zap in forced user mode, and then you get locked out. Zap goes, oh, you know, you're no longer logged in, we're going to run the authentication script, which then registers a completely new user for you, and carries on. And then you get locked out again. Oh, we'll just create a new user and carry on like that. So I think there are a huge amount of possibilities here. And I want people to play with it and have some fun and see what you can come up with. And when you start pushing this stuff, you will come across things you can't do or doesn't, you know, bugs or ways it doesn't work in the way you want it to. Let me know. Because yeah, this is still early days, so I haven't actually released this yet. The, most of the code's checked in, so you can try it out. But you know, there will be problems. Please have a play with it. And um, yeah, let me know how you get on and what you suggest for. Um, for fun things to do. So I'm going to go through this quite quickly uh, because I have demoed Plug and Hack la um, last time in AppSec EU and um, USA, so you can see the videos for that. Uh, so Plug and Hack Phase One was all about one making it easy for browsers and security tools to work together. So in Zap we have this on the Quick Start tab. We have a plug and hack button that will then launch your default browser and allow you to configure that as long as it's Firefox to work together. We would like to support, we're trying to get the other browsers to support as well, but no luck yet. But what it does, it actually, it does a like gives us a hook into the browser. What we've done in phase two is we actually inject, we can allow it to inject, inject JavaScript. We don't just do this by default because obviously it's changing things. But what it does allow us to do is handle things like the post message API. So we can actually intercept and change post messages, even though they are completely on the browser once you've injected this JavaScript. And one of the demos I, I did last time was fuzzing post messages and actually finding um, DOM XSSs in um, post message, which is kind of cool and not something else that any other tools you um, can do, as far as I'm aware. But one thing I wanted to mention was that uh, phase three, we're working on phase three. I was hoping to demo it today, uh, but we didn't quite get it working in time. Um, we're carrying on with the client side um, because it already sh uh, showed you various events, and what we're doing now is exposing more events because it was quite a pain to do the right launch this window uh, and then click on here. What we're doing is allowing plug and hack to enable client side desk recording. So you'll be able to say, right, I want to record this client side script and then it will launch a browser, you will do your stuff, and it will record everything in Zest format. And then you can rerun that, you can change it, you can tweak it. So it's work in progress, but it's, it's nearly there. Talking of work in progress, we've got a lot of fun things going on. One of the um, big complaints is the fuzzing, in, I hear from people there's fuzzing in Zap. It's really good, really simple, but you can only fuzz one parameter at a time. Um, so Sebastian is working on, for the Google Summer of Code, is working on advanced fuzzing. That will allow you to fuzz multiple parameters, but actually give you a load more um, things you can do. So that's going to provide a lot more advanced functionality. And he's already released something, so 
very much alpha status at the moment, but you can download that from the Zap Marketplace and have a play with it. Um, we want feedback on all these things. Cosmin is working on advanced access control testing, and this is really fun. Uh, as I mentioned to some of you I've already talked to, Cosmin is the third, third year he's been part of the Zap team for Google Summer of Code, and he's carried on working on Zap in between as well. His first year he rewrote the spider to make it much more effective. Uh, not the Ajax spider, it's a different student, but so the standard spider. And he got the understanding of sessions handled properly. Last year he worked on authentication, so all the authentication stuff you saw in the user understanding and understanding roles, Cosmin did, did that. And now we've got that basis, we can, he's working on access, automated access control testing. So we can actually understand, we have all the pieces, we can put them together and we can do some very advanced stuff on that. If you want more details, then grab me afterwards, either here or on the open source showcase. Alberto is working on SOAP service scanning. So again, I think he's got a, an alpha add-on already available, so that'll take a WSDL file um, and populate the sites tree. And he's already started doing um, web service specific attacking on that. Then we've got a couple more students who are not, this is not part of Google Summer of Code, they're just doing it as part of their master's degrees. Lars and Stefan are working on sequence scanning. So if you th by sequences, I mean things like a kind of wizard interface where you have page one, page two, page three, and at the moment, Zap, like pretty much all scanners, will go page one, parameter one, attack. Page one, parameter two, attack. Page two, parameter one, attack. And the application should go, you're out of sequence, go back. But, you know, it'll just carry on blindly. So the idea is we're going to be allow Zap to understand sequences. What are sequences? Well, they're Zest scripts, because Zest gives us that structure. So what you'll be able to do is say, scan this Zest script. And basically, then Zap will go, page one, attack the parameters. Page two, parameter one, I've got to go to page one first, then attack parameter one, page, and it'll actually go through the sequence correctly, but still performing all the attacks. And then Avinash is looking at sequences again, but looking at abusing the sequences, um, and trying to work out ways to skip things and go between different users and different sequences. And I think he's already found a significant vulnerability in a major um, web application, which I'm not allowed to name, uh, based on his research he's been doing with Zap. So a lot of fun there. Um, a couple more Google Summer Codes, which aren't really directly Zap related, or only slightly, but OWTF um, is adding both Zest and Zap integration. And we've got a Google Summer Code student working for Mozilla, uh, which I've already mentioned, working on this Firefox Zest add-on. So that means you won't have to ask people to install Zap, you can just say, download this add-on, press record, reproduce your vulnerability, you know, doesn't matter whether it's client or ser server side, and then we'll have a Zest script you can attach to the bug report or send off to the, to the company and say, here's my proof, here's how you reproduce the vulnerability, really nice and easy. As I said, there is more stuff going on behind the scenes, which I, just to let you know. One last thing I want to say is the source code. Um, so the source code currently all on Google code, we will probably move to GitHub, but I just want to make sure all the issues and everything is moved across as well, and history and things, so it's a bit of a messing around. Um, but I want people to get involved. I've got a Packing Zap blog series, and there's four posts on there at the moment, which explain how to set up the development environment and take you through, through things like passive rules and, and active rules. And we've got simple examples you can take and you can play with and you can customize. Got a lot of information on the wiki, um, the internal details, but you can never enough documentation, and really what you want to do, if you're interested, get onto the Zap Developer Group and get in touch and just let us know, you know what, you, what, you, what you want to know. And we will help you as much as possible. So I'm trying to leave some time for questions. So I'm going to wrap up now by basically saying that you know, my conclusion is Zap is changing very rapidly. There's a huge amount of stuff that's going on right now. It is the most active OWASP project, I don't think anyone de denies that, um, code project anyway. I'm now claiming it's the most active open source web application security project. No one's disagreed with me, so it must be true. Uh, so, you know, it really is good for people new to application security, but I'm saying it's actually really great for security pros as well. If you're new to application security, you're a developer or something like that, I think Zap is the only web security tool you need. If you're a security pro, you should not be using one tool. If you only use one tool, you're doing it wrong. Or at least if you only, if you only understand one tool. 
you should understand the capabilities of all the main tools out there and then you should choose the one that's most appropriate for you and I cannot tell you what that is but if you don't understand Zap properly then I think you're doing it wrong you might not be using Zap but if you understand what it can do then use whatever's right for you but I do want to say at the end it, it is a community tool based tool please get involved I want more people involved and more people to play the stuff and that is it so who's got the first question okay so the question was do we plan to integrate DOM XSS scanning yes when? When? <laughs> uh, so I was I was hoping to have done it by now uh, got sidetracked by the zest stuff so what we so clearly what I've been doing is working on the client side scanning um, so both plug and hack and the new zest changes all very much client side and this was very much all working towards client side scanning and this is generic client side scanning rather than just DOM XSS so what I want is actually have an infrastructure so we have passive scanning active scanning client scanning and then that will be a plug-in thing and you'll be able to write your own um, rules if you like and download them exactly the same sort of infrastructure not sure exactly when but that is definitely that that's the direction we're going in there's another Yeah, so the question was um, which browsers can be launched um, through Zest scripts. We're actually using Selenium. So I haven't finished, this is not, you know, I haven't released it for a reason. It's, you know, still a little bit flaky. Right now I'm testing with Firefox, Firefox, and Firefox, not surprisingly. Um, but I want to make sure that it works with pretty much all the browsers that Selenium supports. It certainly should do. We just want, need to make sure the um, configuration is there. I definitely want it to work with Chrome and IE. Uh, I want to, to work with headless browsers as well because I want to do that persona login completely headless. So your slammer JSs and things like that. I, one of those I will definitely um, make sure it supports. Uh, but uh, and you know if there are other things, I think I've already got something in there where you can you can spec within Zest. You say you can give there's a set number it's set name so you can put in IE, you can put in Firefox, you can put in Chrome, or you can put a full class name in. And if that class name is a web driver, then it will use that. So in theory, it will be anything. Um, but obviously, in practice, then there might be some glitches, in which case, yeah, um, pull request welcome. Are there any um, best practices or recommendations um, for documentation uh, regarding to implementing that using that into uh, binary recognition process? So focus on automation. <laughs> Um, so questions are any advice and best practices for integration integrating zap into security automation testing no unfortunately uh, a lot of people are doing it so we're doing it in Mozilla I know various other companies are doing it we haven't really pulled those best practices together I think a lot of situations are kind of they're all a little bit different but it'd be really great to pull people's experience together and we've got tools like ThreadFix which is really good um, and we've got Minion within Mozilla, which can you know, control multiple security tools. But I'd really like Zap to be to put in different CI environments uh, as many as possible and have advice and guidance around that. We haven't really got that, but please come onto the developer group, ask questions, and we'll try and pull that together because, yeah, we could really do with that. And if you've got any suggestions, then let us know. Yep, so I see there's three main, three, three main use cases for Zap. Um, one is the, you know, people new to application security, developers QA, so using Zap as a kind of point and shoot tool, and then learning about security more. Um, then you've got the professional pen testers really focusing on the manual stuff and using automation just to, you know, cut down the amount of work they have to do. But then Zap in a continuous integration environment, um, running your, proxying your aggression tests through Zap, so that explores the app the application explain and show Zap how it really works um, so that you know your developers check code and a couple of hours later you get an alert to say you've got a, a cross-site scripting vulnerability because they forgot to escape one parameter you know and you get that within hours rather than you know a week before you you go live when you run the pen test so yeah I absolutely that's a real key use case for me for Zap so yeah we could really do with some more documentation around it and yeah help appreciated Fantastic. I, I, 
I Thank you, Jerry. I'm so excited when I'm in these app stores because every time you give it, it's like there's more features and there's. They're all. Yeah, it's really amazing. Like, even just the beginning, when you're talking about like switching to various personas, like my heart started like racing. That said, um, Minion, what's the status on Minion? Because I know that you're using part of Zap. Uh, so Minion is another tool developed by the Mozilla security team, and it controls different security tools. And this is very much a kind of web interface, and we wanted it, it to be something that uh, a security could set up, teams could set up for their developers. So developers could go to Minion, an internal site, say, this is where my site is, and I want to um, run Nmap against it and Zap against it and all these other tools. So, yeah, it's still in development. We had a little bit of, you know, one of the developers uh, had time off and things. So it hasn't progressed as much as we wanted, but I think we've got some Google Summer of Code students working on it now. So, yeah, it's moving forward. I'm not directly involved in it, but I'm kind of obviously indirectly involved. And all this thing with the um, persona integration, you know, that's key for Minion and all these other tools. Two more little sub-point questions. Uh, they, these would be super quick answers. Number one, uh, I know we've talked about Okay, question is, how, which bits of Zap can you pull out and use? Uh, Zap is it's kind of modular inside, but we haven't designed it that much to be completely reusable. There are some exceptions. So plug and hack was designed to be tool independent, and Zest is absolutely tool independent. So it's, you could, Zest is actually a standalone runtime. Um, so we have a Java runtime, but you can, we've, obviously we've got the Google Summer of Code student writing a JavaScript runtime. You can write it in whatever language you like, and if you'd like to write a Python or Ruby runtime for Zest, please get in touch. Um, the Ajax Spider is based on Crawljax, so that's another open, which then uses Selenium again. So you, Crawljax, yeah, you've got a good chance of reusing it. But yeah, some of the other bits are a little bit too integrated. But, you know, Give me a shout off, you know, in the development group or offline. I'll try and help you to, because uh, we want we want to develop components that can be reused. But a lot of the stuff we do is kind of tied into other Zap things. So I can send. I can like drop me emails on, yeah. on various stuff. And then you answered the second sub question, which is I was 99 percent sure, but you can script most of Zap headlessly. Is yeah. Right? Yep. So Zap runs headlessly. We've got a daemon mode, uh, and it doesn't. So we've got a REST API to that. Uh, and it's very powerful. It doesn't always do everything, but we're getting there. And if there's anything you want the API to do that it doesn't do at the moment, then get in touch and we'll kind of accelerate that or give you some hints on where to start implementing. But the, yeah, I really want the API to be fully functional so it doesn't, you know, we'll have a clean separation with a zap functionality and it doesn't matter whether it's been driven by the UI or the API. So that's, that's the end goal. Awesome. Awesome. Next question. No more questions? Right, that's it. Thank you very much. I'll be around here. And